And there you go. That is a Wilkinson splitter slash combiner. We have a output resistor connecting our two output ports and the value is two times your impedance. If you're working in a 50 ohm environment, this resistor is going to be 100 ohms logically. And those funky lines here are uh, transmission lines. A quarter wavelength exactly and the impedance of those quarter wave steps is going to be the square root of two times your desired impedance. Uh, the reason being that those quarter wave steps act as a transformer because the impedance presented at this port is going to be a different one than the input impedance presented here. So you have to transform between that and a, a quarter wave line can do this in a very easy way. So uh, you have your quarter wave step here, you have uh, Z in, you have Z zero, and you have uh, Z Let's name it out here and uh, you can match this perfectly if Z in is not equal to Z out there's actually this behavior present in a quarter wave line and you have a transformation that uh, follows this formula here so you can calculate what value for Z zero you need simply by rearranging this formula here. And in our case here, you have 100 ohms presenting themselves here, 50 ohms here. So the translation you need is you need 70.7 ohms up here in a 50 ohm environment. And uh, as a generalization, that is the square root of two of, uh, of your impedance. All right, so that's easy. And why does this work? Why is there a higher port isolation in a Wilkinson divider than there is in a resistive splitter? Well, let's think about this real quick. Let's imagine we inject a signal right in this port. And we have two things happening. Number one, a little bit of this injected signal will go through this resistor and be present at this port. So it will go through here, appear down there. So, so why would we do that? I, I thought we didn't want any coupling to the other port. Well, remember, this is a quarter wavelength each way. So the signal will also travel this way, then travel this way, and also arrive at this port. Think about it, it's a quarter wavelength each way, so we have half a wavelength eff effective travel way. So if our signal goes in like this, then at this port, by the time it has traveled around, it will be the inverse of what we put in. A half wavelength is uh, equivalent to 180 degrees phase shift, a shift at a given frequency. So uh, you have this little leakage here combined with the inverse of that, or the uh, uh, quarter wavelength delayed half wave, well, that's complicated, half wave delayed um, signal appearing here. So those two, I don't think I drew this very well, but this will cancel itself out. You're gonna have, ideally, in theory, absolutely no signal left. Now, of course, this is the, the theory. In reality, you're going to have somewhere between 10, 20 to 30 dB attenuation between the two ports, but that's a whole lot more than 6 dB and a whole lot more practical. Now, the other side of a Wilkinson divider is that uh, it's less lossy. You have no real resistive losses. That's a big bonus, especially when you're designing those kind of splitters slash combiners for higher powers. And uh, another thing is you can build a very simple equivalent of this circuit uh, with uh, lumped elements. Let's imagine you would try to build a Wilkinson splitter for lower frequencies. Let's pick 150 megahertz, or let's pick 100. So 100 megahertz is going to give you a uh, wavelength of three meters, and a quarter of that is going to be 0.75 meters and uh, seven, so 75 centimeters. And that's a little bit over two feet. So if each one of those sections would have to be two feet long, you would have a pretty massive Wilkinson divider. So at lower frequency, this is undesirable. At high frequencies, uh, let's say several gigahertz, you can build this uh, strip lines directly on your printed circuit board, and that's what's commonly done. So how do we get an equivalent of this circuit? Especially, we don't just need the, the runtime between those two points. So it's not just about the, the delay of the signal running here, but we actually need to consider our impedance transformation. If we do not match 
this impedance seen here and this impedance seen here, 100% correct. We're going to have reflections and all kinds of other nasty things that may cause us more problems than we want. So, if you think about your transmission line, let's make this a piece of coax. So this being connected to ground and you have your center conductor in there. What is this thing? Okay, so you have a metal conductor in the middle. That's an inductor, right? It's inductive. And you also have a ground close to this center inductor, isolated by some sort of dielectric material. This may be the, uh, the PCB material on a strip line. This may be PTFE or a different type of uh, dielectric in an co actual coax cable. Or it may be air. It really doesn't matter. It is some sort of material with dielectric uh, uh, properties. And therefore, you have a capacitor. It's basically two plates next to each other. So you can draw an equivalency of this circuit like this. This is going to ground. And there's another capacitor here. Also go into ground and once again, you can clearly see why I always had an F in all arts related classes. Nonetheless, this Pi network here does actually uh, exhibit the same properties as this quarter wave line up here. Oh, I should maybe write this on here. And uh, how to calculate this for a given frequency is actually uh, relatively easy. So if we plug this into this again, we can rearrange and get this. We have our input, then we have uh, capacitor number one off to ground. We have an inductor. We have another capacitor going off to ground. That's our port number one, output port number one. Now let's call this C for common. And then we're branching off here. Second port. Ground, another capacitor. Yeah, I should really take some classes on technical drawing. Anyway, that is the equivalent circuit Almost. That's the uh, two quarter wave lines. Of course, now we need our resistor. And like I said, if we're assuming a 50 ohm environment, this is going to be a 100 ohm resistor. So if we do this here, Z in equals 50 ohms, that's going to be true. Now, those two capacitors on the output, of course, are on their own on their isolated port, but those two are both capacitors on the same path to ground, so you can just eliminate one of them. And if this is C and that is C, and this here is two times C, and uh, that's it. That's going to be a Wilkinson splitter slash divider with uh, lumped elements. Very easy. Uh, the uh, the way it was derived was very easy to follow. I hope. If not, let me know, and I will help you. I'll explain it in a different way, but I think it's very easy to follow. Um, now, the problem of course arises if you have a tuned part or, or something that is dependent on the frequency you're using, like a quarter wave line, you're going to limit yourself in bandwidth, obviously. If we build the circuit for 100 megahertz, it's not going to exhibit the exact same properties at 200 megahertz. And that's an issue, and that is one of the downfalls of the Wilkinson splitter slash combiner. The resistive splitter, like I said, theoretically works from DC to sunlight. It's really just the upper limit is going, going to be uh, your, your circuit parts that you're going to use, your PCB material, your connectors, but theoretically it's DC to sunlight. This here does not work the same way. So what is the bandwidth of a Wilkinson splitter or combiner? Well, the answer really depends on how much port isolation you want. It really depends how far down you can go. Obviously, the more you deviate from the frequency you calculated the Wilkinson splitter for, the less this is going to be 180 degrees out of phase 
and therefore the less attenuated your coupled signal is going to get. So again, to answer the question of bandwidth, really depends on your requirement for how much attenuation you need between the port, or isolation is what it would be called. If this uh, splitter provides you with 30 dB attenuation and you need a minimum of 25 dB, then that is your margin. You're going to have to sweep this and you're going to have to figure out what that 5 dB margin is in the frequency domain and that is going to be your limit. If you say, okay, all I need is 10 dB isolation, then you're going to have a whole lot more bandwidth available. And there's one strategy that I'm just going to mention as a little aside that is done to expand the bandwidth and this looks as follows. So here's this little trick to expand your bandwidth a little bit. Instead of designing this whole input stage for your desired input impedance, you actually pick a different intermediate impedance here that gives you a better bandwidth and then you transform with another quarter wave line between your input 50 ohms and this intermediate impedance. I'm just going to mention it as an aside. We're not going to dig into how to calculate that. But that's basically what you need to know about a Wilkinson splitter and combiner. And here are two examples for a resistive splitter and a, so far we can only say non-resistive splitter. We'll take a look inside and see if it is a Wilkinson splitter or combiner. Fact is, we don't know. But we can see here the isolation between ports is a little bit higher than 6 dB. It depends on the frequency range. If we go at the mid value here, 6.6 .6 dB for this resistive type splitter. And over here, it's a whole lot higher. It's specced at uh, typical 28 uh, dB in the mid range. That's a whole lot greater, almost five times greater than this resistive splitter here provides. And you can see this one here goes from DC to 2000 megahertz. So we have a bandwidth of 2000 megahertz. While this one over here goes 5 to 500. That's a bandwidth of only 495 megahertz. So uh, definitely less. But anyway, uh, that's just to show that the data sheet confirms what I've been telling you. Now let's have a look at how this, those two actually behave as far as port to port isolation is concerned in a real circuit and then we're going to open up this splitter here. We opened this one up in the last video so we're going to have a look inside this one and see how many circuits uh, built that one. So the first thing I'm going to do is put this resistive splitter between a signal generator on port 2 and our oscilloscope on port 1 and that way we're going to see how much of the signal from the sig gen makes it through from port 2 to 1. We expect something around 6 dB, a little bit of extra loss for the connectors, the wires, and uh, well, reality. So uh, let's have a look. I have the MDO 4000 set up over here to be our signal level meter, so to say. And uh, over here, again, I have the LeCroix wave station, a signal ge a generator. So I will insert the splitter, like I said, and I terminated the common port here with uh, a 50 ohm load just to make sure everything is perfectly terminated. Now if I go back to the uh, Tektronix scope here, you see that the power shown is negative 7 dB roundabout. And the power that I am feeding into the uh, splitter is 0 dBm. So we have a loss here of about 7 dB between the ports, which is not really a very high isolation. So now let's do the test with the other splitter. Let me go back over there. 
There we go. Here's the other splitter. And while we're over here, just to confirm, see the output power is set to zero dBm. And uh, if we go back to the Tektronix scope, we see 3435 dBm. That's uh, pretty impressive, especially considering that this is far over the value that it's specced for. But again, we need to take into consideration that there's going to be uh, line loss, connector loss, but just judging by the other splitter that we tested before, and we knew 6 dB is coming from the splitter. There's no way around it. So uh, we only had a little over 1 dB extra there. So if we assume that the same is true for this here, uh, we can say that this splitter is definitely under spec uh, because the actual specifications, at least at this frequency, is significantly higher and uh, you may think it's only a few db but 5 db almost 6 db difference here is, is a lot as far as power is concerned 6 db less is a quarter in power that that is a lot well anyway that is the setup here that i used and just to make sure that we take a look at the common port to output port. Let's flip this around here and do this. We would expect 3 dB insertion loss. Uh, if we look at the specifications here, it's specced at 6.3 at mid range. So let's see what the tech scope says. And we got, well, let's round that to four and a half. Four and a half dB, very nice, okay. So we learned two things. This splitter for once has a much lower insertion loss and has a much higher port to port isolation. It does, however, have reduced bandwidth. So this is just a great example to compare resistive splitters with uh, other kinds of uh, splitters and combiners. In this case, most li likely a Wilkinson. So let's have a look inside and verify what's actually going on in it. Now I did make the assumption that this here is probably going to be some sort of Wilkinson splitter slash combiner, but we don't really know. So let's find out. Here we go. and. Uh, Right on the first side, it appears that this actually is a Wilkinson splitter. We can see the uh, 100 ohm termination resistor up here that's bridging the two ports to make sure that we have a null between the two ports. Then uh, we also see that uh, there are capacitors on each side, one there, one here. Then we have our inductor right here. Then uh, we do have another capacitor down here. We have a pad for another capacitor here. So somebody maybe experimented with different values and it was just easier to uh, take the same value and put them in there. And uh, if you do stuff like that, there's often no reason to change it for production. Uh, maybe this is for custom type things where you just want to experiment or it was a, was a cost reason. Who knows, maybe buying a big reel of the same caps and putting two in there was cheaper at some point. We don't know, but we also see a second inductor in here. Uh, one of two things may be possible. They either may be in series to uh, change the inductance or what's more likely is that they're doing exactly what I showed you earlier, that uh, you have this network right here, the actual Wilkinson splitter, but the input impedance is some sort of intermediate impedance that's then being matched by another transformer network. And that's very likely what they did here. Uh, very interesting to see, as usual, a very clean, a clean design. Remember, this is the common port, and those two are the input slash output ports. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, make sure you give it a thumbs up and you share it with the world. And if you have any questions or comments, leave them down below in the comment section. See you next time.